so we'll discuss about the interstate risk management interstate interstate risk can be managed using internal hedging methods such as matching and smoothing it can also be managed through external hedging called as forward rate agreements interstate derivative futures options and swap so we'll start from what is an matching matching is where liabilities and assets with a common interest rate are matched for example subsidiary a of a company might be investing in the money markets at libor and subsidiary b is borrowing through the same market at libor so there is an asset and there's a liability in the same company so and both of them are referenced to the libor so what happens the asset cancels out the liability and hence it's like equally hedged if libor rate increases subsidiary b's borrowing cost increases and subsidiary a's returns increase so what happens is if the interest rate is going to increase the borrowing cost of b will increase and the income of a will increase so both will compensate each other the interest rates on assets and liabilities are therefore matched so that is what is the matching concept is all about so now we'll move on to the smoothing concept smoothing is where a company keeps a balance between its fixed rate and the floating rate borrowing so assume that you are a company and you want to borrow 100 crores so what you do is you you split it into 50 crores and 50 crore the 150 the the first part of the 50 crore you borrow it in fixed rate fixed interest rate and the other loan you borrow at a floating interest rate okay so what happens is even though the floating rises or fall at least you are 50 percent you are happy so 50 percent at least the rise and fall is matched a rise in interest rate will make the floating rate loan more expensive but this will be compensated by the less expensive fixed rate loan so what happens is um, if you are going to borrow all in the floating rate again that's a uh, risky if you borrow all the loan in fixed rate again it's risky so what you do is you have a combination of both company incur increased transaction and the arrangement, arrangement cost because of this because if you are going to borrow all the 100 crore loan in fixed it's like one time you can do it if you want to do it in floating also you can do it one, one time but if you want 50 crore in this arrangement and 50 crore in this arrangement then you are going to raise the money twice so that will lead to more transaction cost major companies with large amounts of borrowing may try to maintain a balance between the fixed rate and the floating rate so that is about the smoothing concept so we'll move on to the external hedging which is called as a forward contract a forward contract is a customized contract between two parties to buy or sell an asset at a specified future date we'll see the forward contract with an example assume there's a buyer and there's a seller the buyer wants to buy gold okay the price of gold today today is at 3000 the buyer feels the price can go to 3500 and he wants to buy the gold but not now in three months time in three months time so in three months he feels that the price might go to 3500 but he says that i will buy the gold at 3200 whatever the price is okay whatever the price is he will buy the gold at 3200 on the other side there's a seller who sells a contract he feels the price of gold will not even be 3100 in uh, three months time so he feels that there is a guy who is willing to buy the same gold at 3200 rupees in three months time so he feels he could easily make a profit of 100 through this transaction so what is the essential difference is the difference is the 
respect to the buyer feels the price will go too high the seller feels the price might not go too high okay or he might even feel the price can even go lower okay so only when there is a two different perspective a contract usually gets created the forward contract is fixed at 3200 okay so that is about the contract so on the third month on the third month what would happen the buyer will give 3200 rupees to the seller and the seller will give the gold to the buyer but who's like uh, profited through this transaction it's not about the profit or loss about the transaction it's about the fixing of the gold rate okay today so that it would be like paid on the third month end and the gold would be received irrespective of the market price we'll have a computation like this so we'll take the buyer and we'll take the seller So we will take it as inflow and outflow. The buyer has paid 3200 for an asset and the seller has received the same thing. So that is an inflow of cash so that he gets 3200. If the market price, if the market price of gold, of gold is 3500, okay, as per what the buyer thought, then how would the profit and loss would be? So the the buyer gets the 3500 worth of goods so that good he would have he has paid only 3200 so he gets a profit but the seller has to give this 3500 worth of gold so he essentially makes 300 loss so the profit or loss depends upon the market price we can also change the market price and look at how this works the market price rather than rising from 3000 to 3500 it actually gone to 2800 so the price has fallen now let's see what happens to the case so as promised so as promised the 3200 will move from the buyer to the seller but what would the seller give the seller will only give 2800 worth of the gold the gold would will be transferred that is the market price of the gold that is what he will transfer the buyer has actually paid too much he has given 3200 to get a gold which is only 4 2800 worth so he is going to lose around 400 rupees and for the seller like what he thought he thought the price will move only from 3000 to 3100 but the price has actually gone to 2800 so the difference between these two the difference between these two will give him the profit okay so the profit or loss in the forward contract depends upon the forward price which has been fixed and the market price on the expiry of the contract a forward contract can be used for hedging or speculation Although it's non standardized in nature, it is particularly apt for hedging. So, the forward contract is not an exchange traded contract, it is just a contract between two people. So, this is like very good or apt for hedging purpose, and the people can involved in hedging or even for speculation purpose. Forward contract can be customized because it is not an exchange traded contract, it can be customized for any commodity, amount, or delivery date. Forward contract settlement can occur on cash or delivery basis. So we spoke in a, as a, an example of gold. It is not the actual gold that has to be given from the uh, from the seller to the buyer. It can also be the gold's worth. That is, gold would not be exchanged in hand. Even the worth of the gold, that is the two thousand eight hundred rupees or the three thousand five hundred rupees, the worth of the gold can also be transferred. So it can be a cash-based settlement or the delivery of gold based settlement forward contracts do not trade on a centralized exchange and are therefore regarded as over the counter instruments so forward contracts do not trade in the centralized exchange they are then called as over the account over the counter instruments 
so now we'll move on to the fra so fra forward rate arrangements are an application of the forward contract to interest rate FRA is a forward contract that fixes interest rate now for a future short term lending, investing or borrowing transaction. So an FRA is essentially a forward contract where the underlying is the interest rate. Okay? So the underlying interest rate is a very important concept here. If the actual interest rate at the date proves to be higher than the rate in the FRA, the bank pays the company the difference. So, a company has, has bought an FRA, okay, FRA of 10% interest from a bank, from a bank, okay, and this is for 3 months time, for 3 months duration. So, what would happen here? See, the FRA is essentially 10 percent and the actual interest rate and the interest rate at three months time what happens is it has come to 15 percent then it means that the bank has to take care of the five percent that is the bank has to pay five percent to the company that means the effective interest the effective interest for the company would be 10 percent We'll put it like this the company has made a bet the bet is the interest rate will be like going up so they feel that the fra is 10 percent but the interest rate in the third three months time has actually gone up so it means that they have made a profit how much profit the profit is five percent so the five percent will move from the bank to the company so effectively if the company is going to borrow a loan it doesn't need to pay 15 percent it pays 15 percent as a loan and it got the 5% benefit from the bank. So the effective interest rate is only 10%. We will also look at the other case. For example, in another contract, the company has entered into a 10% FRA. It has bought. But the actual interest at the 3, three month time is only 7%. Okay. So they have made a bet that the interest rate will go up. But it has actually gone down. So what happens here is they have made a loss. And that loss is a profit for the bank okay that is a profit for the bank the company has to now pay if the company now borrows they have to pay seven percent as interest they have to pay three percent as a loss to the bank put together you get the same ten percent okay so however you work the interest rate will be the same so whatever the fra that has been fixed that will be the effective interest rate here so that is what is being explained here if the actual interest rate at the date proves to be higher than the rate in the FRA, the bank will pay the difference. So that's what we saw just now. If the actual interest rate is lower than the FRA, the company pays the bank the difference. So that is what the arrangement is. If the interest rate goes up, the bank will pay the difference. If the interest rate falls, the company has to pay the difference. An advantage of FRA is that for the period of the FRA at least, they protect the borrower from adverse market interest rate movements to levels above the rate negotiated, negotiated for the FRA. That means the rate that you have fixed in the FRA is what you essentially pay as an effective interest. So once you have taken an FRA, it is like booking in advance what is the interest that you want to pay. If you buy a 10% FRA, then it means your effective interest rate is 10 percent if you buy a fra for 12 percent your effective interest rate is 12 percent so that is about the fra contracts so we'll see the fra payoffs the bet is made on the interest rate not the bond price the long position in an fra is the party that has already borrowed the money or is about to borrow the money so we say that you buy an FRA when you feel the interest rate is going to go up. Okay, if you are a long position, it means you have buying the you are buying the FRA. It means you are betting that interest rate will go up. That is your concept. So when the prof, 
so you make a profit when interest rises and you make a loss when the interest falls what is the short position in the short position you sell the fra you sell the fra that is in effect you bet that the interest will go down okay how do you do that for example uh, you have you have deposited in a fd so the fd interest rate is 10% you feel the interest will fall and it will come to something like 8% you want to save this okay you want to save uh, the fall the 2% fall so what you do is you enter into an fra and the fra is at 10% so if you are making you are selling the 10% that means you are going to receive this 10% and if the interest rate goes down by 8% that is what you are buying so this is a selling and this is the buying if you net it out you get 2% interest through the fra so you are essentially you have sold it first and you are buying it later you have sold it at 10 you are buying at 8 okay so you have made a profit of 2% so the actual interest rate is how much now the actual interest rate has fallen so the fd will give you 8% but the fra profit is 2% so put together you have got the 10% interest so that is your effective interest okay so we'll repeat it again the short position is used by a investor the short position is used by the investor the investor feels the F, the interest rate is going to go down so what he does is he sells an fra at a higher interest rate that is 10 percent and he feels the interest rate will go down so he buys at a lower interest rate he makes a profit of two percent the actual fd deposit has also gone to the market interest rate of eight percent so he has made a loss in the fd so his interest rate has only become eight percent but he has made a profit in the fra so that is two percent and totally he now will get ten percent as his interest income so in the short position if the profit if the interest falls if the interest falls just like our example the company will make a profit but if interest rises then the company will make a loss so that's about the payoff in fra so fras are arranged with the bank as an otc transaction an fra is not an arrangement to lend or borrow that is not the concept fra is an agreement or a bet made on the interest rate it is an agreement that fixes an interest rate on a notional amount of principal so what is a notional amount there is no like uh, transfer of uh, loan amount or investment amount only the bet is made on the interest rate and any gain made on the movement of the interest rate is like paid one limitation of FRA is that they are usually available on loan of at least 500,000 pounds. They are also likely to be difficult to obtain for periods of more than one year. So FRAs are essentially a, a medium term instrument. So we will see the terminologies involved in FRA. If they give you a parity like 5.75 to 5.7 it means that you can borrow at 5.75 and you can invest at 5.7 so you always if you want to borrow the borrowing rate is higher than the investing rate this is the same parity that also happens in a bank deposit bank deposit and borrowing if you go to a bank the fp will be six percent but if you want a loan that will be 12 percent so always the borrowing cost will always be higher than the investing income so they also say that a 36 forward a 36 fra a 36 fra is an agreement that fixes an interest rate for a period starting in 3 months time and lasting for 3 months time at the end of 6 months so we'll see an example for this similarly a 312 fra fixes the interest rate for a 9 month period starting from the 3rd month. See the first number for example we say 312 FRA here it refers the contract will start in the 3rd month okay 
so assume the year is in january in 1st april the contract will start okay and the total period of fra the total period of fra it is a 12 month fra that means it starts in april and it runs for a period from the 1st jan it runs for 12 month period that is it ends in 31st december okay so essentially it is only a 9 month contract it is essentially a 9 month contract okay so we will also do for this 36 forward if you take a 36 for forward it means if it's going to be january 1st january today uh, the contract is going to start in the third month and it will run from the third month to the sixth month so that is what the fra means so the contract will start on the third month means like january february march is over so it will start in first april and from april april may june so up to 30th june the contract will run so essentially this is for a period of three months only okay so you can just so the first number indicates the starting of the fra period okay and the ending number tells the month in which the fra gets over so we'll have a quiz now a company treasurer needs to borrow 10 million euro for 180 days 60 days from now the type of fra and the position he should take to hedge the interest rate risk on this transaction so the company wants to borrow a 10 million euro that means it is a long they are trying to go for a long position okay and the loan is going to start in 60 days it means uh, in two months time it's going to start and it's going to run and uh, the loan is for a period of six months so the entire fra is for six months okay so from the first month into the eighth month the fra would be the life it starts in second month it will run up to the eighth month it is a six months of duration of fra so two bar two into eight long position is what the answer is the answer should be b So we'll move on to the next one. It's called as interest rate derivatives. Interest rate derivatives can be used to hedge against the risk of interest rate changes. They include interest rate futures, interest rate options, and interest rate swaps. So we we'll look at what is a futures contract. A futures contract differs from a forward contract in the following ways. The transaction in forward is an overtrade contract. In futures, it's an exchange contract. In terms of counterparty risk, there is more counterparty risk in forwards as it is an over the trade counter. No such risk exists in futures. In the nature of contract, the forwards are customer visible because it is only between the parties. But in futures, the nature of contract is fixed or it is a standardized contract. The size of contract also depends upon parties in forward contract. In futures, it is fixed. Maturity, it depends upon the parties in forward. In futures, again, it is fixed and standardized. Settlement is usually done only on the date of maturity. But in futures, it is like daily settled. Okay, so that is what we called as the mark to market settlement. Variation here, there is no margin or anything which is involved upfront. But in futures, there is an upfront margin and also a maintenance margin. The valuation, there is no valuation required in forward contract. In future contract, there is a mark to market settlement on an everyday basis. So, we will have a quiz. Which of the following most accurately describes a derivative security? A derivative always increases risk, no, has no expiration date, again, that is a wrong thing, has a payoff based on a other asset. So, that is the Right, that is the name of a derivative. It derives a value from a, another asset. So, answer C should be the answer. Yes. So, we have another quiz. Which of the following statements about exchange traded derivatives is least accurate? So, which of them is wrong? That's what he wants. They are liquid, 
yes because as there's a market every day settlement happens so this is a correct option they are a standardized contract yes again this is also a correct option they carry significant default risk this is a wrong option because default risk happens only in a otc market that is for a forward kind of contract so this is wrong and they are asking which of the following is wrong so c is the answer option g option c is the answer here so we'll move on to what is the interest rate futures interest rate futures are similar in effect to fras except that the terms amounts and periods are standardized so it is an fra but it is like trader in the market short term interest rate futures contracts normally represent interest receivable or payable on notional lending or borrowing so it is only notional there is no full amount of loan or investment which is transferred and only on a notional amount the future interest rate is calculated for a 3 month period beginning on a future standard future date so so in interest rate futures everything is like standardized the contract size depends on the currency in which the lending or borrowing takes place for example a 3 month sterling interest rate futures march contract represents the interest on notional lending or borrowing of 500000 pounds for 3 months starting at the end of march and 500000 is the contract size so if you see here everything is like standardized the contract is a 3 month contract it is a sterling contract it is a interest rate futures contract the contract is uh, going to end in the month of march and uh, it can be on lending or borrowing the amount is also like mentioned here so it is being like mentioned everything in a particular specific way so that is what an interest rate futures is in forward contracts all these specifications can be changed as with all futures a whole number of contracts must be dealt note that the notional period of lending or borrowing starts when the contract expires at the end of march the problem with the futures is assume that you have you want to hedge uh, something like 800 1000 but the contract is available only for 500 1000 so the problem is you can either buy a one contract for 500 1000 or you can take another contract for 1 million but you can never take a contract for 800 1000 okay so that is a problem with futures because if you take 500 1000 contract you cannot hedge for the balance 300000 if you take a 1 million hedging then you are like over hedging your position with 200000 so there is always a under or over hedging problem with the interest rate futures in forwards you can create any contract as per the amount that you want that's why forward contracts and uh, are very famous when compared to futures contract futures contracts are available with maturity dates at the end of march june september and december so these are the ending or maturity dates for a futures contract and they are also fixed the standardized nature of interest rate futures is a limitation on their use by the corporate treasurers as a means of hedging because they cannot always be matched with specific interest rate exposures so there are some drawbacks in terms of interest rate futures and that is why corporate treasurers don't prefer interest rate futures in this slide we look at how interest rate futures work interest rate futures do not move with inter with interest as fra does because ir because interest rate futures is based on the bond price and not the interest price and yield are always inverse in nature if interest rates rise the bonds price will fall and vice versa borrowers will wish to hedge against an interest rate rise by selling the futures that is 
If the company has borrowed at a 10% interest, then the bond price would be 100 and they feel that the price of and they feel that the interest rate might go up and they want to hedge it. How do they hedge in IRF is they try to sell the future. Why? Because if the interest rate goes up, okay, that is what they thought. If the interest rate goes up, the price of the bond actually falls down. Okay. And the interest rate futures are priced based on the rate of the bond and not the interest. So if the company wants to borrow, okay, or if the company has already borrowed and they want to hedge their interest rate, that is they are feeling that the interest rate will go up, then the company has to sell the futures. The reason is the current interest of 10% will give the market rate of 100 and if the if they feel the interest rate is going to go up to 15%, the price of the bond will fall. As the IRF is like mentioned in terms of the bond price, they have to go in for selling the futures. So the company has already sold the futures at 100 rupees and the interest rate has gone up and the bond price has fallen and now the company can buy the bond. So they have essentially sold it before and they are now buying it. So their company will make a profit of some amount. So that is how interest rate futures work. So assume that you are a lender or an investor or an investor in a bond and you feel that the interest rate might fall down. So what you should do, you feel that the interest rate will fall down. So what you should do is you have to buy the futures. So currently the future is interest is 10% and the price of the bonds are 100. So essentially you first try to buy the bond. So the buying the bond is 100 rupees. So after a particular point of time, the interest would go down like actually how you thought. So when the interest rate goes down, the futures bond, the bond price will go up. So at that point of time, the company can sell it. So essentially they can make a profit. Okay. So you also have to, you always have to think in YC versa. So borrowers sell futures and investors or lenders buy futures. They go in for buying futures. Okay. So that's how they are related. So we'll have a quiz. Which of the following statements are correct? Interest rate options allow the buyer to take advantage of favorable market movements. Yes. If you want, you can exercise the option. If you don't want, you can allow it to expire. An FRA does not does not allow a borrower to benefit from a decrease in interest rate. That is also true. Irrespective of what is the interest rate, you have to pay the interest rate fixed by the FRA that you have to pay. Borrowers and borrowers hedging against an interest rate increase will buy interest rate futures now. No, borrowers will sell will sell interest rate futures. No, that's what we saw. So this is wrong. So 1 and 2 are correct. So A should be the answer. The answer is A. So we'll move on to the next topic. It's called as options. A currency option is a right of an option holder to buy or call, sell or put a quantity of one currency in exchange for another at a specific exchange rate. The excise rate, the excise price, the strike price on or before a future expiry date. So we'll start from what is a call option. A call option is an option to buy an asset at a particular price this is termed as a call option. The seller of the call option has an obligation to sell the asset at the agreed upon price if the call buyer chooses to exercise the right to buy an asset. We will see how this works in terms of a interest rate. Assume that you are a borrower and you feel that interest rate will rise that is it is currently at 10 percent and you feel it will go to 15 percent. So you could have used an uh, FRA or you could have used an interest rate future or you can go for an option. So what you have done is you have choosed an option. So what is an option here? In option you are going to buy 
a call option okay you're going to buy a call option that is you feel that the interest rate is going to rise that's why you're going you are buying a call option so you feel it goes to from 10 percent to 15 percent so the call option works like this you have to pay a option premium you have to pay an option premium that is that is to enter into the contract you have to pay this and once you have got paid the premium you have the right what right you have you have the right to receive right to receive interest above 10 percent okay so if the interest rate goes to 15 then you will get the 5 percent will be like received by you if the interest rate goes to 12 percent in three months time you will receive the two percent balance so you have the right to receive interest above three months ten percent and this is in three months time okay this is a three months concept so on the third month okay on the third month the interest the interest is 14 percent okay the interest has come to 14 percent see if you're going to borrow now you have to pay an effective interest of 14 percent but as you have taken uh, options okay you have taken uh, options now you have to pay 14 percent but from the option you will get how much from the option you will get anything above 14 percent so anything above 10 percent is 14 minus 10 you will get 4 percent as income or profit from the options contract if you go and borrow at interest rate you have to pay 14 percent so if you deduct both if you deduct it effective interest for you is only 10 percent okay how does this occur because from the options you have got the right to receive more than the 10 percent so as the interest rate is 14 you got the balance of 4 percent that is a profit for you and as the market interest rate you have to pay 14 percent if you're going to borrow that is an outflow so outflow of 14 and inflow of 4 will give you 10 percent so that's how it works look at other cases also for example if the market if the rate has not gone to 10 percent more than 10 percent but it has gone to something like 8 percent okay in the options contract you have the right to receive anything above 10 but it's only 8 percent is the interest rate so you won't get anything in that case you will allow the option to expire that is you don't pay anything and you won't receive anything you have essentially got nothing so now your effective interest is 8 percent so it works like this I want to draw diagrammatically we can draw like this you you will maximum pay only 10 percent as the interest rate if it falls you get the benefit also if it falls to eight percent you are eligible for the benefit that is how the options work so your maximum is always capped at 10 percent but you are allowed to enjoy like how much ever the fall is in the interest rate see this is not possible in fra or in interest rate futures because there you have made a commitment to pay 10 percent always so if that's going to be a if you're going to make any gain you can't get it because if the interest rate falls by eight percent then you have to pay the balance two percent to the bank and the interest rate will come to the same 10 percent if the interest rate goes to 12 percent the bank gives you the two percent and your interest rate again comes to 10 percent fra and in irf the interest rate is always at the entered one the 10 percent but in options you have the option to pay 10 if it's like favorable to you you can take an advantage if it's adverse to you you don't take that okay so anything favorable you can take an advantage of it so we'll discuss about the put option an option to sell an asset at a particular price is known as put option the seller of the put option has an obligation to purchase the asset at the agreed upon price if the price if the put buyer chooses to ex exercise the right to sell the asset so we'll also see how the put option works see if you are an investor and you are getting around some 10 percent as the interest and you feel the interest will fall 
to something like 5%, so that is a bad uh, situation. So, what you will do is, you will try to buy a put option. The right to receive any interest any interest below 10% so if the interest goes below 10% then the option holder has the right to receive the interest so this is for a period of 3 months okay so in the third month time what happens is the market interest rate comes to something like 7% okay so the company will be like receiving 7% from the market because they are an investor and they have already invested at a variable rate the they have already invested 10% but the current market rate in the 3 months time it is 7% so they are incurring a loss but they have an option as the option is now favorable for them what they will do is they will excise their option and they will receive they will receive the difference so what is the difference as per the contract they have the right to receive any interest below the 10 percent so anything below the 10 percent is 10 minus 7 so they will receive 3 percent so they have made a profit so totally they have got again the 10 percent as the interest so the hedge has worked perfectly for them but we will also look at a case where things are not like that example the market interest rate rather than going down by down it has gone up and it has gone to 13 percent okay 13 percent now will they receive the difference no the option is as it has gone against them what they will do is they will simply they will allow the option to expire so still they will get 13 percent so again if you draw a chart it works like this the company will always receive 10 percent if the, it's going to be uh, higher number they will receive that number okay but in future but in irf or fra case they will be receiving the same 10 so this profitable part okay this profitable part is available only with the option okay but the drawback of option is to enter into this contract the company has to pay option premium okay so that is about the options contract put option So, interest rate options allow an organization to limit its exposure to adverse interest rate movements while allowing it to take advantage of favorable interest rate movements. Okay. So, that's what both the charts will tell you. So, if you take a call option chart or you take a put option chart. Okay. If you have, if this company has taken a call option will be taken by a borrower and a put option will be taken by a investor. Okay. So, for a borrower, if the interest rate goes like this, okay, and if it falls, he will take advantage as of this also. He has the ability to take an advantage of this. So, if the 10% goes down by 8%, he will take an advantage of this. For an investor, if he is going to receive 10% always, and if the interest rate goes up to 12, he takes an advantage of this also, okay. But why is it like so important? It's important because in a in a irf or a fra okay they cannot take the advantage this favorable movement advantage they cannot take okay so here also they cannot take the favorable movement advantage so that is the problem and that is the benefit what options give you so options is the one which gives you to limit the exposure to adverse interest rate movement at the same time to take advantage of favorable interest rate movements. This is a very important topic from the exam point of view. Try to ensure to understand this. Interest rate options are linked to reference rates such as LIBOR or URIBOR. An interest rate option grants the buyer of it the right but not the obligation to deal at an agreed interest rate. So it gives you an option it the interest rate option give, grants the buyer the right to buy the asset
on the date of expiry of the option the buyer must decide whether or not to exercise the option tailor made otc interest rate options can be purchased from major banks with specific values maturity period denominated currency and rates of agreed interest the option of the the cost of the option is the premium interest rate options offer more flexibility than and are more expensive than the frs so again this is a very important point so options are costlier than the frs because they, for that you have to have pay a premium clearly a long or buyer of an option is an option to borrow will not wish to exercise it if the interest rate is now below than specified in the option agreement if the interest rate specified in the option agreement is 10% and the market interest rate is 12% the option buyer will exercise this right if the market interest rate is 8% the option buyer will allow the option to lapse conversely a short or seller of an option is an option to lend will not be worth exercising if the market rates have risen above the rate specified in the option by the time the option has expired if the interest rate specified in the option agreement is 10% and the market rate interest rate is 8% the option buyer will exercise his right if the market interest rate is 12% the option buyer will allow the option to lapse so now we look look at the interest rate cap and floors an interest rate cap is an option which sets an interest rate ceiling a floor is an option which sets the lower limit to interest rates using a caller arrangement the borrower can buy an interest rate cap at the same time sell an interest rate floor this limits the cost of the company as it receives a premium for the option sold so we look at a picture so assume that a company company's interest rate keeps on fluctuating so they feel that they want to have it within a range of 5% to 2% so what they do is they don't want to take any risk more than 5% and they don't want to pay anything which is less than 2% so they want a range between 2 to 5% as their interest rate they are very comfortable with this position so what they do is they go for a option they go for a option they buy a call option they buy a call option so what happens is they pay a premium they pay premium for this okay so whenever it goes above 5 the other company will pay money to the to this company so assume that the interest rate is 6% the company will receive 1% as their income okay so even it is 6% even the even when the interest is 6% the income will be like 1% from the other company it is because the option will be exercised and the company will pay effectively only 5% but at the same time what happens is they don't want to to risk they want to restrict themselves with the uh, uh, interest rate of 2% so what they can do is they can sell a call option again they can sell a call option for this they will receive premium they will receive a premium so what happens here is if the interest rate goes to 1% okay if the interest rate is goes to 1% the company has to pay another 1% to a, another company so the company will pay the company's effective interest is the current market interest they have to pay that is 1% okay the option premium will be excised by the other company so they will ask another one percent so that comes to another percent so that comes to a total of two percent so that is effectively what is the range they wanted the range was five to two percent so interest rate caps collars and floors is what this so the above thing is called as the cap the lower end is called as the floor and put together is this 2 to 5 is called as the collar so 5 is the cap 2 is the floor 2 to 5 is the 
caller okay hope you have understood this we'll go to the next point so the cost of a caller is lower than buying a option alone however the borrowing company foregoes the benefit of movements in interest rates below the floor limit in exchange for this cost reduction and an investing company foregoes the benefit of movements in interest rates above the cap level so that is the drawback of a interest rate caller our overall premium is lower because we are also going to receive a premium so our overall premium is low but for that lower premium we have we are sacrificing a benefit okay the benefit is 5% to 2% so this is what we are sacrificing okay we have to pay always 2% but we are going to reduce a premium because for this we have received a premium so our premium is a income here our a premium is a extra outflow here so put together if we put our premium could be actually a little bit lower than a normal premium alone that is what they are mentioning it here a zero cost caller can even be negotiated sometimes if the premium paid for buying the cap equals a premium received for selling the floor so when the premium to be paid and the premium to be received are equal we can also create a zero cost caller so we'll move on to the swap interest rate swap so interest rate swaps are where two parties agree to exchange interest rate payments it is not done through exchanges hence it is a counter party risk involved interest rate swaps can act as a mere means of switching from paying one type of interest to another raising less expensive loans or securing better deposit rates assuming that the interest rate swap interest rate swapped is in the same currency the most common motivation for the swap is to switch from paying a floating rate interest to a fixed rate interest so the normal kind of a swap is done for interest rates is in terms of converting a fixed rate loan to a floating rate loan so this is known as the plain vanilla swap so we'll see it in through an example so we can have it like this so company a has borrowed a fixed interest rate loan and company b has borrowed a floating rate loan but after raising only they have found that this to be uh, not a good kind of a loan but they can't close this loan because usually this this would have been raised through a bond uh, for 7 years okay and again this would have been for a debenture of 7 years so they cannot like quickly close this and all so what they have to do is they have to have this bond and pay a fixed rate but still this company feels they want to pay a floating rate this company is paying a floating rate but they want a fixed rate so what can they do is they can mutually exchange so company a wants to pay a floating rate so they pay the floating rate to company b company b which is already paying a floating they want to pay a fixed rate so they pay the fixed rate to a so both are happy this fixed rate which is received by a is like quickly transferred to the bonds and this floating rate that was received by company b is quickly transferred to the debenture so both companies have made their debenture holder and bond holder happy at the same time they have also exchanged their interest rate pattern okay so it's very simple like this this loan interest is paid by this company and this loan interest is paid by this company so they have altered their interest pattern so we'll see an example here so here you can see that over a period of every six months the interest is getting swapped in interest swapped the capital is not swapped okay the capital is not swapped only the interest part is swapped and even the interest part only the interest difference is swapped okay only the interest difference swap for example this company pays a fixed coupon of 6200 this company pays a floating of 3300 so this this goes to this company and this goes to this company so will they transfer this full amount the answer is no only the differential okay the difference between the two are getting transferred 
this company will take it as company A and company B. Company A has to make a payment of 2,893 from A to B. Again, there's a minus symbol. So again, A will pay to B. Okay, again, A will pay to B. A pays to B. A pays to B. And again, A pays to B. Only in the last scenario, the B pays to A. Okay, so only the net amount is like transferred and not the whole amount. So capital is not at all transferred. Interest is calculated, but only the interest differential is transferred. This is a very important point of swap. So if you see the net interest differential is what is being transferred from one company to another company so we'll have a quiz in a plain vanilla interest rate swap the notional principle is swap is it true there's no interest swapped at all so this is wrong only the net interest payments are made this is right the notional principle is returned at the end of the swap no so answer should be the answer is b So we have another quiz. Which of the following statement is least likely an advantage of swap? So which of the following is not an advantage? Have little or no regulation? Yes, that is a advantage of swap. Minimized default risk? No, it is an over the counter transaction. So it has a high amount of risk. Have customized contracts? Yes, it is an over the trade contract. So it is can be customized. So the disadvantage is B. So the answer should be B. The answer is B. So questions from the past exam. In the past exam, this these questions were asked in section C also. But going forward, you will have these questions only in section A and B. So you will have like problems. You will have like theory questions. So this is a very important part of section A and B. So ensure that you understand this part of the syllabus also. So thank you very much for watching. We'll meet in the next video.